Hello friends. Welcome to our new episode of Postrails webinars. Today we have a very special, very young uh, wildlife photographer. In fact, uh, he's also from uh, based in Dubai. We used to shoot together uh, in our Al Qudra Lake. Uh, yeah, Ritik Dubey. He is a 22 years old wildlife photographer. I'm not going into detail. Let us hear from him what he is. He have to tell today. He have to share with us today. So let us welcome Ritik. Hi, Ritik. Hey, Hermes. How are you? Good man. How are you? Amazing. Great to be here. I've been looking yeah. forward to this since a very long time. <laughs> nice, nice. Thank okay. you so much for coming on. No, it's a pleasure for me. It's a great opportunity also to you know uh, speak about my experience and my journey. So thank you for that. Sure. Nisha is here. Uh, she's not at here. She is having All some right. difficulty with her internet. No she's worries. in India. No worries. Yeah. All right. So a little. I think you uh, gave a little introduction about me. So I'm 22 years old. Yeah. I started uh, photography in. 2015 or 16 so it's been almost seven years now that i've been doing it and i i'm still learning still uh, you know trying to take in as much as i can from things that i see every day so i'll just you know through the slides and through the presentation i'll take you guys through it should i start yeah, yeah. all right so actually, this is one of the pictures from India. I love shooting tigers as well. So can, can we make this a uh, full screen? It's full screen, right? It's not yet full screen. One second. I, Maybe you can reconnect. Screen, right? Close and reconnect. Oh, Put right, the right. Uh, full, yeah, full sh uh, screen share option. The first one. I think. Are you seeing the white border? Yeah. Oh, actually. No, not I the white know. border. I can. I can see all the uh, tabs. Everything. Oh. Okay. Then let me just figure out what's wrong. You can choose the option. Uh, share the entire screen. There's no option. The first, I... the first one, and their screen. No, you have to disconnect this first. Disconnect the screen first. Disconnect. Uh, sharing. Okay. Stop sharing. Yeah. And okay. share again. I'm sorry, I'm new and to this software. Screen. No worries. Yes. No worries. And their screen. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. There's no yeah entire screen. That's correct. That's what yeah. I did. Click on that and share. Try yeah. To do it again. yeah. Better. Yeah. Now it's fine. It's fine now. Yes. 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 All right. So Perfect. let's move on to the slides. Yeah. So here is the first one. So how I like to compose. Basically, I have a very uh, I have this thing in my head that I want to show as much of the scene as possible. I don't like going in very tight. So you won't see me doing very tight close-up portraits of the animals that I'm shooting, but more of things like this, which shows landscape and the subject uh, slightly smaller as compared to the whole setting. Um, and there are a few fundamentals that I like to follow, like the rule of thirds, which I uh, learned about quite early on in my journey. I went for a workshop and I was told that it's very important and it's uh, it's essential that you follow the rule of thirds or something like that to, you know, compose your images, to place the subject and background and foreground. So following that, the subject here, I have consciously placed the wildebeest on the left corner 
because if you see the grid of rule of thirds, the uh, the lines would intersect right about here where the where the priest is standing. Yeah. Now, here is another example of what I was saying. I like to show settings like the whole scenario. So this tiger actually was quite far away, and I was on a four hundred mm lens. So this is still a cropped image, but uh, four hundred mm was just enough to frame it right to show enough of the background and put in some foreground as well and still get the tiger in focus and uh, you know convey it like it's in the water and there's a big space behind it and all that okay another thing that i uh, keep in mind or actually i i just do it kind of subconsciously is that i like to isolate subjects which a lot of the people also do out there and here for example in the first image that you see on the left it's a topi standing on a mound in masai mara now i had to wait a little bit for this one to get isolation because just on the right side of the topi there was another topi which was looking up and the grass was tall enough so as it went down it completely hit behind the grass so it worked out like that so i had to wait to get the shot and it was a little far away as well so it gave more depth uh, you know to the image yeah uh, the image on the right this was also in masai mara and it's an elephant that was a little far away from the rest of the herd so instead of going to the herd i went to this guy and i was i the entire evening i was basically just with him because he was alone and he wasn't really going back to the herd and there were no subjects around it just uh, to bring in disturbance um okay next one low angle is another very important thing in my uh, i don't know checklist when i'm shooting it's not always easy to get and it's not always possible as well but whenever i get a chance or whenever i see that it's possible i try my best to get the lowest angle possible because what happens is when you are at the angle of the subject in the picture i mean you are able to connect with it uh, with a lot more ease than uh, uh, compared to when you would look at it from above or from below a lot of the people they like to shoot birds and i see you know pictures of birds shot from an angle where you're just looking up at it and it's not really it doesn't give that kind of an impact yeah. or even uh, lions for that or tigers any any animal for that matter so what i did actually for this picture was i had a jeep where the side was open which allowed me to uh, get a low angle but to get even further low i kind of hung outside the jeep halfway with my camera and i had no no shutter uh, i had no remote system back uh, at that time so i had to manually shoot with the shutter button of the camera which was a little difficult because it was a heavy uh, heavy camera heavy lens but after a few photos it it will you know this work out and you get used to it but this is another example of uh, getting trying to going out of your way to get a low angle so this was in lake navasha in the uh, kenya where they take you on a boat and you can see hippopotamuses and you can see a lot of birds uh, around there near the lake and the boat is a small motor boat it's easy to maneuver and we were three people in the boat and i asked my um the driver of the boat if it's possible for all of us to you know just sit on one side of the boat so the boat would tilt a little bit and he was uh, he was not very confident about that but i convinced him which is not i i wouldn't recommend doing that because if you fall into a lake with hippos i i can't guarantee anything like anything would happen after that so we we did that i got a few shots it's almost like i'm in the water it's as if i'm at the same level as the hippos but yeah i i did that to get the angle otherwise it would have been a little higher up 
yeah this is another example uh, i did the same thing here that i did with the lion i was hanging outside the jeep and it's very difficult actually to shoot that way because the cameras are very heavy nowadays like with nikon's um, z lenses they're very light recently i got to try some of them uh, mm-hmm. the pf ones and they're extremely light it's easy to do that with those but the ones that i've been using for so long like the f mount lenses they're heavy and it's not very you know it's not a smooth operation to carry out yeah but again with practice it 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 falls in place um a vertical flame framing so a lot of people who have seen me on safari ask me why are you shooting vertical i I'm, i i shoot vertical a lot i love shooting vertical and the main reason behind that is that when you shoot vertical you're able to give the image a lot more depth and you can include a lot more background and a lot more foreground it doesn't work in all the images and for all the kinds of compositions but for example here on the right side with the elephant uh, if you see carefully there's a bird flying on top at close to the edge of the image and there's some clouds very very little clouds but again the thing is you can show how vast the sky is you can also show some of the blurred foreground which i like to do a lot so that's i think that's the main reason why i shoot vertical most of the times another two examples uh, here on the right side the tiger that is coming uh, through the trees it wasn't because of depth or anything i i just liked the way the three there are three trees in the image there's one big one uh, behind the tiger and there's two in front of it and one kind of close to me so i just liked how the trees were aligning and i kind of knew that he was going to come right between those two trees so i was prepared for that shot that way just to get it vertical another thing is there's not enough water in the image otherwise you would have uh, seen a lot more reflection so if i was shooting horizontal i wouldn't be able to get as much of the tree and the water at the same time even though it's not there but hypothetically uh the same as with the left one and i don't know it, it was just placed perfectly for a vertical shot there's some more examples of vertical frames here i think you can see why uh vertical would work in the left image of the leopard climbing down so there were trees close to us close to the jeep uh, not trees but bushes that you can see are blurred and obviously you see the leaves on top of the tree from where the leopard is climbing down if i was shooting horizontal for this it it would not really make a lot of sense because i would not get enough of the blurred bushes to show that there's you know a big uh, bush close to me it would just be like a small disturbance in the image so it kind of frames it well if you know what i mean yeah i mean uh now the image in the middle i shot this vertical and horizontal both because i had uh, some time with the tiger she was drinking water and she was there for quite some time so i could you know uh, do both of them and i honestly like the vertical more for some reason i don't mind cutting off my subjects but uh, it's not something i would do on a, a typical basis same as with the lion on the right uh, if i was shooting horizontal at this level i would not get the trees far away in the background that you can see a blur i would just kind of cut the image somewhere uh, along the bush line where the bush ends using natural elements so um whenever i come across a setting in the wild or out on the field where i see there's a chance for me to frame the subject in a natural way uh 
i just go for it or at least i hope that the subject goes there and you know uh, gives me the shot i'm looking for so here on the left this lion he is called mardadi and he's a very nice big male lion he's very uh, beautiful so he was out in the open and he was just about to enter the bush i actually i was not expecting him to go and stop right there but i was somewhere you know focused on that area because i saw like a big opening over there between the leaves that you see on the forehead and the leaves on the chin near the near the jaw so he went there he stopped for a bit and he looked right at me and i was ready for the shot i got it and it's one of my favorite pictures of uh, out of my own collection and the same happened with the tiger over here on the right so he was sitting facing the other direction and i saw these leaves kind of align in a u shape just where the head of the tiger you know would be visible if it turned and i was not expecting for him to turn because there were other tigers on the other side of the bush as well but he did and i was ready for the shot so i got it and that that's one way you can use you know the some people call it disturbances in the image but you can use them to your advantage sometimes yeah uh so this is one of the fast five or the famous five brothers in masai mara it's a cheetah the five cheetah brothers and they were all walking around the tree the same tree that you see in the image and they were marking it now this cheetah it decided to go behind it and there was this small opening and i was focused over there and it was i could see the head in the in the opening but it, it wasn't looking through it and just maybe for a second it happened to look exactly at me and i got this image where it's perfectly framed and it's like it's speaking out of you know uh, the tree so yeah it's a beautiful frame it makes for a good frame yeah if you can yeah. use the um setting to your advantage timing your shots so especially with uh, i think from as much as i know or what i've seen um timing your shots with big cats to get the eye contact is a little tricky because lions or leopards they normally they don't tend to look at you very easily at uh, especially if they're bold or if they're too used to the tourist or the cars cubs would both of them happen to be cubs these pictures are of cubs it's a leopard cub and a lion cub now they the lion cub was eating it had a buffalo kill over there where it's sitting mm-hmm. and it was completely focused on the kill it was not looking here and there it it did not bother to look around even once but there are these rare glimpses they give you and you have to just get your shot that time so you have to be completely focused and you have to be looking through your viewfinder the entire time um even the leopard cub it uh, it was going back to its mother which is further behind in the bush where it's sitting so it went to the mother and it was kind of interacting with the mother it wasn't really uh, focusing on the surrounding but then again it happened to give me this one look and i could get this you know uh, half face kind of an image of it which i personally like a lot because of the blurred leaves in the foreground yeah. yeah and the eyes are very clear very bright sharp uh this is another example of timing or i'd say preparing for your shot not timing so lions uh when when they experience rain when they when they get wet in the rain and if they're sitting in a bushy place it's a bit difficult to get the shot of the shake or of them rinsing of the water mm-hmm. because they pop out their head just for a millisecond and they'll just finish the thing they they don't give you enough time to prepare and shoot so i was lucky enough that this was my first time shooting a lion shake the water off actually i wasn't i did not know how it would happen 
so i was lucky enough that my driver he prepared me he told me he asked me uh, have you ever shot a lion shake its head with water i said no and he told me okay i'm going to tell you exactly when to shoot you be ready and as soon as the lion gets his head out of the bush you sh- start shooting don't even wait so that's exactly what i did and i got it from the beginning till the end i did not miss it anyway so that's how i learned it's not the hard way of learning but i still i could have messed it up real bad yeah yeah um this one is this one is a mix of timing and composition uh i so there's five of them actually the mother is a little ahead you can't see her she's not in the frame but these five tigers were walking together and we were following them behind them on the road and the mother had gone to the right so the cubs naturally they follow the mother so i kind of had this image in the in my head at the back of my head that i would get four of them you know aligned perfectly and that's what happened here and this the tiger in the middle it happened to look at me as well so that's a bonus for me and it's a beautiful composition also it came out it gives yeah it gives like a good uh, you know leading line like it i don't know they they use this term a lot in teaching photography or in the fundamentals wherever you go to learn leading lines which i honestly i don't understand in the technicality of it but i think somewhere it applies over here yeah okay interaction emotion and behavior these are three things that i love to capture with animals or with birds now this image here is from india and this is an example of interaction this is playful behavior between two uh, tiger cubs and they're from taroba national park so they were actually in the water for a very long time and they were playing a lot they were you know jumping around grabbing things from the water throwing them around and i like this image a lot because you can see the tail kind of whipping off the water and the face of the second tiger on top uh, you know just he looks very excited for some reason to me and water always makes for a good element in the pictures i feel from for myself at least personally here's two more examples the the first one uh it's of the black rock pride from masai mara and this was we we were about to leave the pride i had been shooting them for almost the whole evening and we were about to go elsewhere but this was exactly when we kind of left and i saw this cub sitting there like this and i told my driver just stop this stop just go back and we went back and he was just dangling his paws like this in a very cute way you know and kind of looking completely done with the day uh this adorable and i love this image because it's just cute it's really cute <laughs> the second one is behavior and somewhat to do with timing your shots i think getting a yawn also is not very easy i i have missed it a lot it's easy for some people but i've messed it up a lot of the times uh here's another example of interaction now typical lion behavior is whenever they come close to each other they will for a fact greet each other and the way they greet each other is by uh, rubbing the heads together so this this also calls for a good uh, this makes for a good picture is another example of interaction between two elephants and yeah there's not much technicality to it it's just uh, beautiful to witness and shoot this is emotion on the left the baby langur looks like it's smiling or he's very happy to you know get his picture taken and the mother is kind of 
alert or conscious of me being there as a bigger predator with a camera and a jeep and here on the right this behavior the tiger this male tiger he's marking his territory and the way he was marking it is absolutely just bizarre to see it's it's incredible to see actually you know just it looks like he's trying to lift the trunk of the the bark of the tree up and it's, yeah it's a, it's a good picture for me personally okay post processing um i won't go into a lot of details for this one i'll okay i'll start off by talking about what softwares i use which are pretty yeah. basic so first off for file management i have been using for the longest time adobe bridge um which i think was quite famous a few years ago but now people have been recommending that i switch to some other software it's kind of slow to be honest um then for processing i i start off with camera raw the uh, bridge kind of opens the images directly into camera raw where i get my uh, basic settings correct i change my color balance white balance um kind of fix the hues if i feel like they're somewhere off and then i would go to photoshop i prefer photoshop over lightroom honestly i've become very used to it and i feel like it gives you a lot more control than lightroom it might be a little slower but then again trying to perfect a picture in a way it's easier to do on photoshop i do use lightroom a lot as well if i'm doing batches or if i uh, have to you know prepare a series so in photoshop some of the tricks or tips uh, or some tools that i like to use first of all dodge and burn i tend to do quite a lot of dodging and burning on the subjects like for example here on the right side this is a marabou stalk um and it kind of had light falling on it from the uh, from one side and one side was a little dark but i kind of brought it out using dodge and burn a little more and i made the right side a little darker and the other side a little more brighter um the same here with the lion i have i've if i go into detail it take a lot of time to explain how i you know go about doing my images because i do a lot of specific things for each image they are different for each image but uh, yeah the, my workflow starts from camera raw where i fix my contrast my blacks whites um and the white balance and then i go and you know work on them in detail in photoshop and lightroom whichever one i decide to use here's some before and after images so it's uh it's a raw out of the camera compared to what i've uh, done in camera raw on the left this was a sunset uh this was a few weeks back yeah when uh in masai mara and it was a sunset and this lioness was just between the sun and me so it's a little difficult to get the exposure right over there and nowadays most of the cameras they have a very good dynamic range what that means is you can recover almost 90% of your image details so just by bringing up the shadows and bringing down the whites a little bit uh, and playing with the blacks and the highlights little bit i was able to you know recover most of the image and it's usable and it's actually pretty good i like that image a lot uh, the second one is where i've introduced some contrast i haven't done much i've brought down the shadows to kind of blow out the the ground and the grass and mm -hmm. bring in a little bit more color in the background and then i would just you know sharpen it uh, maybe add a little bit of vignette and that's that pretty much do it 
black and white is something I love to do, black and white or monochrome, uh, because from personally for me it gives a very classy, uh, rich look to the image, and it it just looks beautiful. If you if you look at black and white photos on a wall frame, they look phenomenal, and again for black and white i have a few techniques of processing so i use calculations there's a tool or a function called calculations on photoshop which um, lets you you know create contrasty black and white images using different blend modes and using different uh, layers um, another way uh, an easier way to do black and whites is by there's this thing in Photoshop called a camera or filter. You can just open that and there's an option you can see, I think on the top right, where it says B and W or black and white. So if you click on that, it will open a panel of all the colors that are in the, uh, in, in the image and you can play with the intensity and the luminance of the colors over there. I'm getting a little too technical, so I'll just go to the next. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Other things I like to shoot. I I don't focus on birds a lot, but I, I absolutely love them. I love birds. One, because they're beautiful. Second, because shooting birds makes you very technical as a photographer. You have to be you have to be superb with your uh, settings and your you know timing and um, everything technical to be able to shoot birds properly and it's it can be challenging also sometimes but yeah i love shooting them these are both from dubai uh, one is a the one on the right is a uh, little cormorant and i think a little i'm not very good with birds but uh, and the one on the left is a purple swamp pen both from dubai from a place called kodra over here landscapes i like doing landscapes a lot um, the one you see on the left, it's from Masai Mara, where it looks like the tree is kind of giving light to all the land. And it's it's a very contrasty, colorful picture. And the one on the right, it's from Goa. I, I can't pronounce the name, and I don't really remember as well. But it was a typically uh, rainy day for Goa. It's like how a typical Goan day would look like during monsoons. And there were these, uh, there was this heavy layer of clouds, and you know, just some amount of soft light falling through the clouds. It looked amazing over there. This is something a little more unconventional. It's called it's it's a bioluminescent um, species of fungus, I believe, which is also found in Goa. It only grows during the monsoon season, and I put it in the landscape section intentionally. So we had gone to shoot this in the dark. It was pitch black. We couldn't see anything without uh, using a flashlight. And this was actually a very challenging photo to do. If you see, if you see closely, there's also a trail left by a glowworm in the, in the bottom right, I'd say close to the, yeah close to the stump of the tree yeah so this was a long exposure shot and there were three of us uh, a friend of mine who's a herpetologist and a naturalist in goa and another friend of mine who's also who's a photographer so both of us both the photographers we were shooting and it was so dark that even the focus light there's a there's a red light on our cameras even that going off would uh, lead to light leak in the image of the other person so we had to take turns to shoot this uh, it was a great experience actually you can you can actually see it uh, with your naked eye you don't need to expose it or uh, do a long exposure okay yeah this is something else i like to shoot a lot that is snakes and amphibians you'll see in the see in the next slide so 
snakes are a bit tricky because you're on a macro lens most of the times unless it's a very big snake like a python or a, or an anaconda but these snakes like a soft scaled viper in the right image or a green wine snake on the left image uh i i personally like using a macro lens or a 7200 at least mm-hmm. so i've i've yeah i've had a good uh, amount of experiences with them and great encounters they're beautiful to look at and ob- observing their behavior is also amazing saw scale viper for example it kind of uh rub its scales together to make this uh saw like sound which is to you know alarm you to to threaten you and make you go away and the green wine also does something like that it flares up uh its scales it kind of expands its body so you can see the gray and the white and the black on its body up here which is normally not there it's completely green and i've had times when my lens has been you know struck by a viper or some other species of a viper has jumped directly towards me so it can be a little little intimidating but it's safe for the most of most of it uh-huh. uh this is a wrinkle frog it's a species of frog found in amboli which is also in the western ghats close to goa and yeah, it was a it was a good experience shooting this frog because it it's again in the night pitch black it's raining heavily we are all drenched and all you can hear is rain and the sounds of the jungle nothing else and you're on foot so that's that's a beautiful unforgettable moment uh this one on the right it's called a hump nosed viper and this is the one that jumped towards me i was trying to do a video of it and my friend was on the other side of the snake and i was where the snake's head was mm-hmm. side where the snake's head was the snake was facing me and i don't know if it's typical behavior for them but they kind of uh jump towards you as if they uh, they pushed against a spring and came towards you so i was looking through my viewfinder and this one jumped and i saw it jumping through the viewfinder and kind of fell back on my back and i just got up went away for 5 minutes i stopped shooting <laughs> cuz i didn't want to get bit by it over there it's a venomous species and yeah. far away from you know all the healthcare facilities and i don't know what mm-hmm. would help anything happen yeah that's that's about it you can check out my instagram there's a lot more images on there also a lot more stories that i think you'd like to hear about definitely so yeah that's... should i i'll close the slides Can you see me? Yes. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ritik. It was an interesting session. A lot of new yeah, faces. Yeah, it was great to talk about it. We have few uh, questions also. Yep. Uwe Outdoors is asking Ricky, we need to know how we can start to be a wildlife photographer. <laughs> okay. To answer that, uh, I'll I'll talk about how I started. I had a very basic camera. You don't need a very expensive fancy camera you know to start wildlife is everywhere you can find it wherever you go even here in dubai where there's not much we can still go and explore a lot you know there's a lot of birds over there so you take your camera you go out explore shoot explore your camera uh, you know play with the settings play with uh, different kinds of compositions follow other photographers that might uh, you know interest you look at their work and it it kind of grows on you then you, you become a wildlife photographer automatically uh what got you started in wildlife photography uh so like in 2015 i had i just took my dad's camera which was a which was a canon 1200d a d1200 i don't know which one it is for them mm. so i took that one and i used to shoot 
I didn't shoot animals. I used to shoot inanimate objects inside the house. Like I would take a watch, put it up my hand, and use the wide angle. Yeah. Shoot it. I used to do things like that, and then I started going to the rooftop of my house, where we used to have this little garden. We used to get a lot of uh, garden lizards and small birds, like doves, pigeons, sunbirds, and I used to try and chase them around all the time. Mm-hmm. So that's how I started personally, and then somebody told me about a wildlife photography workshop, which I had never heard about before. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I signed up for that, and I went for it. And that's where I met the person who taught me the fundamentals, like the very basics of, uh, you know, doing wildlife and ph- photographing animals and kind of understanding their behavior and all that. I was mm-hmm. still very little at that time to understand. I still don't understand them. But that's how it started. And then I met new people. I uh, met made, made new friends. And I kind of learned through all the people and all that. Started making more trips, going for more trips. Great. Yeah. Uh, next question we have. What is that one thing that you see in your photo to make it a successful one? Successful in what terms? I don't understand. Like a, a successful image. Uh, for for my personal meaning of success, I'm happy with it if I if I compose it right and if I get the image that I have in my mind. If it's if it's matching to what I have in my mind, then it's it's a success. But what I've noticed here is is on social media, <laughs> the kind of composition I do does not work. You need tight images like you need yeah, the line yeah. space to be like this big on the screen is, is there any animal that you specifically love to shoot again and again um i'd say big cats i i love big cats tigers leopards cheetahs lions i really want to shoot snow leopards amur leopards siberian tigers i hermes has done all of them <laughs> <laughs> but I think, yeah, big cats I like, and another animal is elephants. I love shooting elephants because framing them and composing elephants to make your entire frame look good is very tough. Yeah, they're, they're a relatively big animal. Composing a big animal is difficult. So it's, cha- it's a challenge, but I love them. Yeah, I have seen that during our last trip. Yes, <laughs> your craze for <laughs> elephants. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one question. How risk was it to shoot the snakes in the wild? It's, um, okay, it is risky. Um, if you get bit, obviously you need immediate healthcare, you, you know, immediate help from yeah. professionals. But if you understand the animal, then it's not really that risky. What I did was I went in with a wide angle lens. I was trying to get the saw scale viper. Mm-hmm. with a wide angle and get the hills in the background, the rocks, everything. I have that image. I'll share it on my Instagram too. Mm-hmm. So it kind of just struck my struck the tip of my lens. Yeah. So don't do that. And <laughs> you'll be safe, I think. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite location to shoot my life? I think I haven't discovered it yet. <laughs> because I can't, I can't make a favorite location. I love all the places that I've been to. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie about it. One last question we have: uh, What inspires your photography? Um, I think there's two answers for it for me. One would be things that, uh, things that touch me in the wild, like. Things that really grab my attention. For example, the image you saw of the lion cub with its paws dang- dangling off the yeah. rock. I just felt this great, you know, happiness after that because I've never seen any animal with that sort of expressiveness, that emotion, and something looking that adorable. So I just want to keep exploring things like that again and again. And then Another thing is I look at the work of, uh, you know, 
for great photographers you know people who won awards uh, competitions and all those things yeah that that's another kind of inspiration even even hermes and nisha for example i've been following your work since a very long time and i've i've actually uh tried to chase photos that you guys have maybe some of them i got maybe some of them i haven't gotten but that's also inspiration thank you thank you yeah, yeah so that's all the questions we have all right yeah all right man thank you so much again we will no hopefully see yeah yeah <laughs> there's a lot more sure 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 yeah. sure okay right. then take care Great. yeah Thanks. bye bye so that was rithik with his experience we have done uh one trip also together and we used to shoot in al qudra here in dubai very nice photographer nice experience again another wonderful session so uh tomorrow we have another session with another photographer i'll be sharing the details soon let's meet let's catch up tomorrow till then